Welcome back to Questing Beast, I'm Ben. Today we're taking a look at Chris McDowell's Electric Bastion Land, Deeper Into the Odd. This is the follow-up that he made to his much acclaimed role-playing game, Into the Odd, which I reviewed previously on this channel. I'll put a link to it right up here. Here is our back cover. The only city that matters enters its electric age. You have a failed career and a colossal debt. Treasure is your only spark of hope. It is a complete role-playing game that chronicles the city of Bastionland, along with all of the different careers that you can have and all the strange things that you can encounter. Before we get into looking at the game itself, quick shout out to some of my new patrons over on Patreon, including that Max Steele, Ido Magal, Zero Trance, Jesse Ephraim, Christian Linke, Andre or Andre Angelis and John Fox. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. Uh, if any of you would like to help support as well, there will be a link down in the description below that will take you to Patreon. Uh, people at the five or $10 levels can also get to see these videos before YouTube and help me pick new videos or new books to review. So it's a very nice, well-produced hardcover book here. Uh, Game and layout done by Chris McDowell. All the illustration is done by Alex Sorensen. And we have some of our other credits here. Along with, uh, there's a bunch of guest writers, including people like um, Emmy Allen, Arnold Kemp, ZXU, Patrick Stewart, Zachary Cox, some other people you may recognize from uh, other OSR books. Bastion. The electric hub of mankind, the only city that matters. Deep country, it stretches forever, the long shadow of our past. In the underground, machines undermine reality. Aliens are here, from beneath the living stars. You have a failed career, you have a colossal debt. Treasure is your only hope. It's a great summary of what this book is about. Nice short summary on playing the game. The GM is called the Conductor here and we get into how to make a character. First thing that we see. Uh, just like in Into the Odd, this is very quick and easy to generate a character. You're rolling 3d6 for your ability scores. You're rolling a d6 for your hit protection, uh, AKA your hit points. Um, you can get more hit points as you become more grizzled, but it doesn't happen all that often. Characters are fairly static. Uh, you get started with some money. You start out with uh, your debt, the youngest player in the game. It starts out with 10,000 um, pounds in debt that you're going to have to work off because people are coming for you. Uh, you can also create a rival that's going after the treasure that you're going for. There's some rules on creating lackeys and how to pick your failed career. Um, basically, what you're doing here is you're comparing your highest ability score versus your lowest ability score. So let's say that your strength is 12, and that's the highest thing you got. You would look in this row. And then if your lowest ability score was maybe your uh, dexterity, which was a nine, then you would go to uh, failed career number 31 and go from there. There is 100 failed careers available in this book. Although if you notice, it actually only, only goes up to 94 on this chart. So what's going on with that? Well, if you create a character and then someone rolls the same failed career as you in your party, Rather than having two people of the same failed career, you roll a D100 to choose what your career is. So that gives you a small chance of getting the special secret careers above 94. We have our rules for playing the game. Uh, basically the same as Into the Odd, with I think only a, a few small tweaks. Everything fits on a two-page spread, which is excellent. Uh, there's a lot of great layout all throughout this book where the principles of control panel design are very much applied. Everything sticks to one or two-page spreads, making it very easy to take in the information. And just to photocopy and print out stuff if you want to make handouts. Uh, I won't go into all the rules since I did that in my Into the Odd video, but uh, some of the main highlights are things like automatic damage, so you're not rolling to hit, you're just rolling to see how much damage you do. Um, although the amount of damage they do can be adjusted, the die size can be moved up or down, depending on if you have advantage or disadvantage. And armor reduces damage. You have your three ability scores, and it's a simple roll under uh, with a d20 mechanic. Here's the main way that you can get more hit points in Electric Bastion Land. Basically, when you take damage, uh, it goes to your hit points. And then if it has, if you're taking more damage than you have hit points, it goes and hits your strength. So your strength stat starts going down, 
which can cause you to take critical damage if you fail a save, uh, which will knock you out. However, if you take damage and it takes you down to exactly zero hit points, then you get a scar on here. So some sort of horrible thing happens to you that you're gonna have to deal with. Um, however, it can also get you extra hit points as you recover from the injury. We have an example of play, which is really great as a first thing right out of the gate. If you're a new player to role-playing games, uh, this is a great thing to have near the beginning because all of these rules can be a little bit confusing and strange, but then you get right into how this would sound in an actual game. I love how the layout even goes so far as to have each concept take up exactly one column, even though it's a long, continuous story. I thought that was really fun. Getting into the equipment that you can buy, along with our cost in pounds. Equipment is continued here. And the, this is the first uh, spark table that we encounter here. So spark tables are found throughout the book, and they are basically a 2d20 table where you have two different ideas that you combine together to create a new idea. So who's selling this? Perhaps it's a mock snail, and the spark two is seems to hate you. So then that quickly gives you something to work with. Now we get into failed careers, which is the majority of the book. So like I said, there's 100 of these and each of them takes up a two page spread. So that's 200 pages of failed careers. So starting off with the gutter minder and then the curiosity compiler, the fringe investigator, the lost expeditioner and so on and so on all the way through. The format is always the same, uh, no matter where you are. Um, so the structure is you have your title here with a number. You have a nice big picture here, all done by, by the artist Alex Sorensen. You have the note here, if you're the youngest player, the whole group is 10,000 pounds in debt to, and it tells you who you're in debt to. Usually some sort of weird faction or NPC that is coming for you if you don't pay off your debts. You always start off with some equipment. You have what obsolete weapons you cling to, or it's often something else. You roll a d6 here to figure out how many pounds you start with, and that gives you some sort of uh, item. And then you also have a second d6 table here to figure out your hit points and then some other items. So even if you have, uh, if you end up playing the same um, character, the same background more than once, then you will often have very different starting equipment and different tweaks to your character to set them apart. So one tweak I would have made, I think two page spread for each of these is a little much. Um, I like how um, it just gives you all this space to work with, but that's kind of a lot of space. There's a lot of empty space here. Um, so it's a little bit of a quibble, I suppose, but I think you really could maybe shrink this down a little bit, maybe move this picture up and shrink it a little bit, and you could easily fit these tables right down here to put each of these on one page. Um, that would reduce the page count of the book a bit. I think it might reduce you know, the cost and the heftiness of the book while keeping all the same information, but uh, it is what it is. And a lot of these are very strange and they really give you the flavor and the texture of the city of uh, Bastion. There's more information about this in the back of the book when it gets into details about the city and how to run it. But a lot of the, um, a lot of the flavor comes from reading through all of these characters and just imagining the city from the information that it gives you. So this one's by uh, Zedek Siu, so that's a um, guest written one, but most of the super fancy failed careers at the back are all guest written and they get stranger and stranger. For example, we have the X sensor by Patrick Stewart. So for example, um, what led you to leave the sensor's office? So perhaps your octopus kept attacking colleagues and you were fired after several warnings. You get an octopus or how insane are you right now? Perhaps you, um, amend any incorrect usage of grammar with force. So you end up with all sorts of oddball characters. You have the conductor's guide, which is the GM's guide to the game. And uh, I'll just start out by saying this is probably the best game master's guide I have ever read. Um, it has everything. It's extremely succinct. It's extremely clear. And it is practical above all else. You don't have like these long essays going into the art of game mastering. It just gives you concrete advice of things to do to improve the game. 
especially in the style that Chris prefers. Uh, Chris has a fantastic blog that goes into a lot more detail about this. He also has a YouTube channel where he goes into the theory behind the game, what he was thinking while he was making it, and so on. So there's a lot of supplemental material that you can dig into, but a lot of it is summarized and packaged excellently in here. Um, this Game Master's Guide, or the Conductor's Guide rather, is something that I would happily give to new players to rapidly get them up to speed with some excellent um, advice on running the game. Everything is often broken down into three bullet points. This is a common uh, pattern that you see throughout the book. So for example, create threats. The more dangerous a threat, the more obvious it should be. Uh, despite the above, don't create soft threats. They should be memorable and leave impact. It's fine to create a threat that cannot be overcome as long as it is widely known and signposted. A lot of this advice I've read before on Chris's blog, and it was hugely influential to me while I was writing games like Knave and Maze Rats. Some more ideas here. Random game inspiration. You can just start creating adventures by putting some of these words together. More advice on conducting the game and how the different mechanics work. Answering questions. Give enough information to make things interesting. Uh, suggest a way to investigate and get more information. Suggest a specialist that knows more. The focus on giving players enough so that they can actually move forward and make choices is hugely emphasized throughout the book. We have some luck tables. So basically, uh, roll a d6 uh, to see what happens if you're lingering in a possibly dangerous space. And he gives you lots of examples of how to hack this, how it works in principle, and lots of ways that it could be used in different situations. So for example, um, you could use it for nightly supply check, you could use it for does shoddy equipment break, and so on. It's always um, four or five or six is a good result. Two or three is kind of a partial success where there's a complication, and one is something really bad. And you can use that pattern in all sorts of circumstances. We have the odd world of Bastion Land. Basically, you have the city of Bastion, where this presumably mostly takes place. We can also venture out into the weirdness of deep country, and or go up to the living stars, which are closer than you might think, or the weirdness of the underground, which is the um, incomprehensible, strange network of tunnels and caves and so on that lurk beneath the city. Understanding the city has these principles. Everything is here, everything is complicated, everything is shared. And these principles are fleshed out throughout all of these other pieces of game advice. We have advice on mapping Bastion, uh, stalking the city, and running or conducting the city. We have some built-in encounters to give you a sense of the sort of things that might be there in different parts of the city. Um, I wish there was pictures of what mapping Bastion looked like. The instructions are pretty clear, um, but just having a concrete picture of that done with the routes all mapped out would I think be really helpful. I was a little surprised to see that there wasn't actually a picture of it in here. Although there are, of course, videos on Chris's channel of him doing that. So a lot of this is worked out in practice there. We have some random spark tables for cocktails, for parlor games, information on deep country, more principles. Things were better before, things are simplistic, everything is inconvenient. How to map deep country, how to map deep water, and if you're going out into the ocean, some encounters you might find out there. All of these are just very flavorful and punchy. Uh, they paint clear images in your head, and they do something strong and impactful that you know leaves a memory behind. There aren't soft or sort of... Um, there aren't, there aren't soft monsters, which is a principle that he has. Everything is very clearly defined. We have the underground, where probably a lot of adventuring is going to take place. It connects everything, everything is a test, and it sits just beneath reality. It's mostly run by these machine or AI type gods that are there to test you, which is a great excuse for why there's all of these tricks and traps and so on underground. It's there to test you and see how you hold up. Conducting the underground, I like how it dissolves into kind of chaos here. With some more encounters. And we get into the inhabitants of Bastionland. Now, um, a great place to start 
with stalking Bachelorette with NPCs is, of course, to look at the failed careers. There's a hundred of them in there, and they can provide a lot of inspiration. We have some random tables for combining manner and their drive to get the flavor of an NPC. And we have some principles. There are all sorts, and they're everywhere. Everyone relies on somebody else for something. They're always in your way. So in this book, especially in the city, people are like scenery. There's crowds of them everywhere, getting in your way, doing stuff, making things complicated. You just have to deal with people constantly. Uh, you have different types of NPCs. And we start off by the fact that there are a type of NPC called mockeries. And mockeries are Muppets. So that's how you know that this is the best game ever made, because there are just Muppets walking around. It doesn't say it explicitly, but if you read it, they are clearly Muppets. Um, so they're creatures of felt, wood, and string, given the spark of life. They act human, but their needs are only imitated. Children love them, real animals hate them. But then you see some more stuff that's much more Muppet-like, like mockeries act like they know they're on a stage. They are more likely to do what is theatrically appropriate. At times, their sense for theater can border on precognition or omniscience. So there's a lot of fourth wall breaking with them. In a, um, a great way to summarize, at least in my head, the feel of the city of Bastion seems to be a combination of the uh, city from the Muppet Christmas Carol, right? Like the first 10, 15 minutes of it. I kind of imagine this sort of uh, densely packed Edwardian city uh, full of snow and people and Muppets wandering around, like the sort of humorous and slightly absurd tone of that crossed with the city from Brazil, the Terry Gilliam movie, where it's just slightly nightmarish and dystopian and there's just bureaucracy everywhere. So those two things kind of mush together are how I picture things. We have aliens that could be there. Monstrosities with lots of spark tables for giving you plenty of ideas. And we have the addendum, which gives you uh, more Game Master advice and content. Uh, a lot of these seem to be built off of blog posts that Chris has done in the past, which is fine by me, because they're really good blog posts. We have a general strategy guide for uh, players, just how to deal with the rules and the kind of environment that you would find here. We It has a little bit of uh, talk about oddities, now, one thing that I really would have liked to see was there is a blog post that Chris made a while ago that has 100 oddities on it, and it's all done in this giant D100 table, and they're really great. They're just like items that have like a weird effect that has a drawback. And instead of having a big table of that here, they're kind of scattered throughout the NPCs, not the NPCs, they're scattered throughout the failed backgrounds, the failed careers um, in the middle of the book. Um, it would have been nice to have just them all in one place, though. It would have been easier to reference them. But we do have some principles on how to create them there. Um, people are everything. Decisive combat, that's a big principle here. Combat is very fast because there's no rolling to hit, it's just rolling damage. So you're just, in every turn, you're maneuvering to try and maximize the amount of damage that you can do, and then you're just rolling it. So you very quickly move through the phases of, should I fight? Okay, we're fighting. And now, all right, we've gone through like one or two rounds of combat, and it's pretty clear whether we're winning or losing. So a new decision point has cropped up. Do I keep fighting or do I back off? And then you quickly find out one or two rounds after that if you've made a good decision, because either you've won or you've lost horribly. So you quickly get to these decision points, and there isn't a lot of slogging around and just hit points slowly ticking down. Instead, the decision is paramount. And that's his doctrine here. Inform information, choice, and impact. Give players tons of information, make sure you're focusing on the choices that they make, and then emphasize the impact of those choices. More advice on big impact, foreground growth and active survival, how to run a city as an adventure, conductor as a game designer. And here's some great content here. I love to see stuff like this because Chris is great at putting out these big tables. 34 good traps. So the principle of traps from Into the Odd that I've adopted for most of my games is that because the more dangerous something is, the more obvious should be, uh, traps should be pretty obvious. Uh, it's not a lot of fun to be wandering in an area that looks safe and suddenly, boom, you've taken damage and there's nothing you can do about it. It's a lot more fun to have danger just be obviously there in front of you and have it presented as a kind of puzzle that you're trying to solve. How do I disable or circumvent uh, this danger without harm to myself? I think that's a lot more fun. 
making small tables, I really like this one. It can be tempting to make these big, long, detailed tables of, for example, random encounters. Uh, Chris recommends you have much shorter tables with very interesting and flavorful entries. So there's just less fluff. We have some example content, unions and rituals. We have some uh, undergangs that you could be fighting, some hirelings, the cosmic angels that you might encounter from the living stars, weird prototype weapons, some strange NPCs that you might use, and ways for your PCs to meet up. Instead of meeting in an inn, you can meet in the Augmentarium, or the Smatcher Ritchie Rally, or the Sanctioned Looting, or the Fire Giant Display, along with some different flavor for that. So just to throw your PCs into a situation uh, where things are chaotic, they're sort of in media res, and they're, they have to act immediately. Dedicated followers of fashion, so fashion in Bastion land. Navigating the bureaucratic labyrinth. This is a whole system for dealing with the kind of crazy Kafka-esque bureaucracy that you're typically going to find in Bastion. There's a whole system for it. So it has all sorts of um, delays and um, backtracking that you have to do. You need to get this form filled out by this guy, but they're gone. But, oh, but first you need to get this certain seal. And then it just goes around and around in circles. Of course, a clever group could probably find a way to circumvent this, um, but that's really up to them. Um, if not, you could be trapped in this labyrinth of bureaucracy for quite a while. Some example boroughs. So here's actual examples of areas of the city that you could use in your game. Uh, like I said, that would be nice to have a picture of the actual map and layout system that he describes so we could see more practically what that would look like in the book. More example boroughs, the eternal library, and at the very end of the book, we have a conclusion, the last word, and very nice, a rule summary all right here, making it very easy to look up important rules just because it's in the back cover and that's easy to turn to. So uh, I don't have much negative to say about Electric Bastion Land. Um, I've been a huge fan of Chris McDowell's stuff for a long time, and this does a great job fleshing out his setting. Uh, the original Into the Odd was very minimalistic, so this gives you an actual setting to work with. Um, the game master advice or the conductor advice is phenomenal and is an excellent starting point for anyone interested in an old school style game. Uh, so strongly recommended across the board. It's one of my favorite books and uh, I will be recommending this to most players I know who want to get into this style of game. All right, that's it for today. Thanks for watching everyone and I will see you next time.